don't know. Is there anyone out there in the world? It doesn't really matter because they're because they're, we're, we're here. So, <laughs> um, hey, everybody who's here and everybody who will be here. Uh, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire. And I have a special guest today, Maurice Suckling. How are you doing, Maurice? Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, Liz and also future people. <laughs> so um, you are a professor and a game designer. So why don't you give a general uh, introduction for people to who you are and what you do before we focus in on the main topic of today? Sure, yes. And those of you who um, will exist and already know this, apologies, I'm sure you are sick and tired of me saying this. So uh, I am an assistant professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, RPI, that's in upstate New York, part of the Games and Simulation Arts and Sciences program, GSAS for short. And so I specialize in teaching storytelling in games and also historical simulations. I specialize in, in board games is my particular area of interest. So that's what I do for my day job. And I mix in with that making board games, particularly historical board games of various different types and kinds and different sorts of eras. That's awesome. All right, so what are you working on right now? I know that you have multiple games because I got a prototype of one. It's not the one we're talking about today, but I do want to flag it because I'm excited about it. Yeah, so let, let me sort of um, just talk about <laughs> sort of a, a, a small <laughs> set of, of, of things. Um, those of you who are designers will will know it's it sort of comes with the, the territory that it's it, it's sort of hard to stop once you start and um, there are many things that you're thinking about and even writing notes on, but I, I'm kind of not counting those. I'm just counting the things that I actually have physical prototypes that are that exist that um, that uh, or, or or just very nearly exist. So I the the game that Liz is referring to is Rebellion Britannia, which I'm working on with Daniel Burt. That's for GMT Games. It's sort of coin-ish, but a card-driven game. Uh, it's a bit like, I guess, Quartermaster General meets Coin in a in a way. Highly accessible, quick playing game, up to four people, four factions, roam against various different Britain factions who are also in cooperation with each other, all trying to sort of win. And uh, Rome is is trying to. It's not. It's after the invasion. The invasion of Britain's already happened, but Rome is trying to stay in control of things, which is much harder than. Uh, you might think if you're you just have a certain level of knowledge about British history and, and the Roman invasion. It was not just that they invaded and they won some battles and then they relaxed and built the wall. It was much more complicated than that. Because setting fire to London and burning everything down, we have the Salaries in, in Wales, we have the Brigantes, everyone is up in re revolt and revolution at, at sort of various times, and Rome is trying to stay in control of that, which is hard because they only have a few legions but those legions are powerful anyway so that's that's one game um a game that actually was just signed uh recently by kevin butcher at fort circle games it's a game called peace 1905 i think will be its its title and that's a game about the treaty of portsmouth which is the treaty that ended the russia japanese war that uh, president roosevelt teddy roosevelt was instrumental in helping orchestrate and making happen. And uh, so that's, so that's a negotiation game. It's, it, if you like, a consim game about peace in, in a way. And, uh, oh, a game I can't talk about just yet. And a, uh, a game that I've just started working on, but we're, we're still very early on with uh, Jason, Jason Matthews making a game about the the Glorious Revolution, 1688, 1689. It's this coup, really, sort of a quiet <laughs> coup of sorts in in England when the king is replaced by his son-in-law. King James II is replaced by William William III. And uh, working on a game on Camelot, on the fall of Camelot. I'm talking to Phalanx about that. That's a slightly further behind than the than the others, because the other thing that's been taking a lot of oxygen for me recently is this game Crisis, Crisis 1914. So that, that's kind of just roughly what I'm up to. I like it. So, okay. 
I, I like the fact that you have a game called Peace 1905 and then also Crisis 1914. So mm -hmm. uh, how did you end up designing these games kind of in the same era of your design life? And do you see a connection between them or is it just an accident? Yeah, actually, I, I do see a connection. In, in general, although I, you, you can probably just tell from what I've just said that I, I dot all over the place with my areas of interest. In general, sort of 19th century imperial or imperial adjacent history and, and sort of skewing towards British history tends tends to be one of my main areas, one of the things that I'm just more knowledgeable about. So it's not a coincidence in that sense. Also, it's not a coincidence in in two other regards. One is one is that in general, I'm just becoming increasingly more interested in historical games that do a better job or just more interested in uh, political and diplomatic dimensions to them. So war games have sort of long had this tradition really since the hobby began in the uh, really late 1950s, early 1960s of focusing just down on the on the military dimension. And that's sort of fine to, to some extent, particularly, I, I guess, in the sort of tactical realm. But if you move into operational and strategic levels of anything that we might approximate as a simulation, war games have generally done a very poor job of that. They're really just not that interested. Uh, it's almost as if it's uh, um, as, as if military people have just been told you can just run this war exactly how you want and just pretend that politics doesn't exist or only exists to 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 kind of serve your ends that there's no such thing as uh, a, a democratic voice that might take a different view from you while you know they could be part of your own uh, state your own polity that those people could be protesting and and saying well that's not what we should be doing. And anyway, our sort of military modeling has just sort of suppressed that, ignored it, or randomized it, or found all sorts of ways to, to, to subdue it, suppress it. And I'm much more interested, I, I find increasingly, in these, these kind of messy aspects, like wars begin and end in a far more messy and interesting way in terms of the narratives that, that come out of this than you might think. So in some ways, you know, one is about the end of a war and the other is about the beginning of a war. It's not just, okay, turn one, off you go and now destroy everyone. It, it, history is much more complicated and interesting th th than that. And they're also linked insofar as both games are sort of like a, um, use a concept of tension. They use it in different sorts of ways, but they're both in a way, you could think of them as, as a tug of war where you're, you're kind of trying to pull the rope. But if you pull too hard, if you win too much, you will lose. So in the case of a, a peace negotiation, if you make conditions insufferable for your opponent, the person on the other end of the other side of the table, well, they're going to storm out of those negotiations. They are not going to sign that peace treaty. So you, you, you've got to win, but don't win too hard. And there's a similar, there's a sort of a parallel with crisis 1914, which is about the July crisis. Franz Ferdinand gets shot. His wife is shot and war happens. But war happens about six weeks later. It doesn't happen immediately and if you in that game if you assert your prestige too hard you, you push too hard for this concept of prestige you're generating too much tension which means that well you're going to cause someone else to mobilize which means that if they mobilize the war starts and the war, that is your fault so you lose the game for starting the war Ooh. so i want to talk some more about that um, but we've got Stuart here saying it's something I really noticed playing American civil war games, very little effort to incorporate the political elements that are crucial to understanding the war. And I, I do think that tactical stuff is fun, but I do, I like that human element in my war games as well. So, yeah, I mean, Jason Matthews did this great talk at GUWS at Georgetown university war gaming society. He did it, um, 2022. If you look online, you, you'll be able to find it still on, on YouTube. But he he was really tackling this this topic quite head on in a way that I, I've not I've heard few people do so. And th and this was really his 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 contention. You know, he he was really saying, um, well, he described it as actually now as being in a golden age of pole sim, uh, uh, pole mill simulations, uh, political military simulations. Uh, but uh, and I, and I agree about that. And I think it. But I do think it's taken uh, a long time for us to to get there and to find ways of modeling uh, 
the humanity in it, right? The, the politics is an incredibly complicated system because it has humans. Well, that's incredibly complicated and they don't all agree. So, uh, you know, now we're starting to find ways we have design tools that help us address that. So, you know, in the, in the case of crisis, one of my objectives really was, was to demonstrate that there weren't these monoliths, right? That it wasn't just that Austria-Hungary says, I want war, and Germany says, I want war, and maybe France says, I don't, but I will support uh, Russia. We have, we have cabinets who don't all agree. We have the wider circle of governments who don't all agree. We have people inside that state who might not be part of the government, but they, uh, they have a voice. That is that is interjecting into that that conversation, and we have concepts circulating around these decisions that are made. So it's not simply, you know, in the, in the case of Austria-Hungary, uh, Leopold Berthold was the was the foreign minister, and he was the one sort of driving things from their from their side. But it wasn't just he decided what to do. He's he's got to contend with the emperor, a whole bunch of other people, who not all agreeing with him. Uh, Count Teaser, in particular, the, the prime minister of Hungary, had a very different view for about two thirds of the, or at least half of the way through the crisis, who felt that they should not be going to war. So, uh, so war doesn't just happen. You know, it, it it's a complicated process with people with different kinds of motivations for for different reasons, and I wanted to try and address. Some of that because I thought it was just much more interesting than than just kind of monolithicizing, if that is a word. Uh, it is now uh, <laughs> these <laughs> these, these um, uh, entire states and their entire complicated, different, uh, competing, conflicting agendas. All right, so you've done a really good job, I think, of communicating to us like what you're supposed to feel and experience and maybe learn from playing Crisis 1914. How does that work mechanically? as a game so what is who is each player in this game and what are they trying to do and then what have you um thrown in their way as a designer mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a one to five player game and each player is controlling a, a major statesman from their, their their nation so in the case of austria hungary that's bechtold in the case of germany that's bethman or bethman holweg in the case of russia that's sergei sazanov in the case of france that's raymond Poincaré. Poincaré, and in the case of Britain, that's Sir Edward Grey. Now, they some of them are sort of chancellors, some of them are, are foreign secretaries uh, or, or equivalents. But these are the people that, in, in my reading, are generally the people who are really sort of the primary lightning rod for their, their different uh, states' uh, responses. So the game mechanically turns out to be a... a uh, sort of hand management, a deck management tableau builder. So this this was a way of me representing the stuff I was just talking about, where we have different people who want different things and they're in your deck, right? And you're trying to bring them out in such a way that they get you what you want. But sometimes, you know, you flip over a card, it might be exactly what you don't want. And there's a way to try and manage that deck so that you're kind of getting closer to what you want, but still things could blow up in your face, right? That, that you might end up, in the case of some of those nations, you might end up mobilizing even though you didn't really want to. So you can, there, there are cards inside your own deck that can blow up for you and, and mean that you lose the game. You start the war, even though that isn't what you wanted to do because you've put them in your deck to try and get you other things, to try and push your prestige up. So it's a risk reward uh kind of kind of concept it's you know the essence of this story is unless you take the view which some historians do take which is that germany wanted this war and seized on this opportunity and austria-hungary sort of wanted a localized war a war just against serbia but sort of found themselves along for the ride unless you take that view then in essence this is a story about brinkmanship this is a story about people asserting their different states asserting their prestige and um things getting out of hand and things not quite working out exactly as as they wanted in the in in, in any case you, you've probably got three of those participants who who under no circumstances wanted a a world war, a European uh, scale war. So um, to represent that idea of brinkmanship, 
you win the game by scoring the most prestige by the end of the game. And uh, you, you score prestige by putting cards on your tableau that have the most diplomatic pressure. So, that, so there, uh, each card is ascribed a value from zero to four. Four means there's a lot of diplomatic pressure. So that would be in the case of in the case of Britain, that'd be Winston Churchill, right? He was he was much more belligerent than everyone else. But you also have plenty of zeros in your deck, people who just do not want war, who are pushing in the other direction. In fact, they might even be taking cards out of your deck. They might be in your own deck, they're causing you you problems. And so you're playing a certain number of these cards to your tableau each each game week, trying to get a high diplomatic pressure score. And if you get a really high diplomatic pressure score, you're going to get high prestige. But if you get a high diplomatic pressure score, you're almost certainly generating tension. And that tension is felt by the other by, by the other participants, by essentially your opposing nation. So if Germany is creating a lot of diplomatic pressure, it's creating a lot of tension for Russia, making Russia closer to mobilizing. And if that happens, Russia mobilizes, Germany loses in this formulation of the game. So, so the kinds of things that are in, in your way are the, the, your own cards help you, but also don't help you depending on when you play them, how you play them, how you control that. The kinds of things that help you are, well, if I push up my prestige, I'm going to win, but you've got to keep an eye on how much tension you're generating. And there's, there's meters, there are levers to kind of reduce that tension, but well, then you're not driving your prestige up. So you're trying to balance these sorts of decisions and watching what everyone else is doing and thinking, well, they're still going up. They're still pushing the, the pressure up. So I think I'd better follow them. But maybe I don't know what's in my deck and maybe I'm going to put too much pressure on or not enough pressure. And then uh, so that that's kind of the core essence. And, and you're, you're right, Liz, in, in terms of um, you know how I want people to feel is really the essence of, of this. I, in this kind of world, right, the, the term simulation gets used and it gets abused and it also gets not used. And um, I'm, I'm keen to sort of push the idea that this is a what I would call a simulation by abstraction, right? So it's not a simulation insofar as, hey, it doesn't have all of the people who were involved at any time that all are ascribed, even if we could do that, um, values that all could fit into a complicated simulation that everything everything is uh, essentially mapping on directly onto reality that's sort of impossible to do in in a board game that is playable in, in 2 hours right but i i'm going to say that it's not just as a sort of willful well, imaginary abstraction that, that this stuff is tied to research is tied to reasons that I can I can I can give such that I, I think it's in this space where it's 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 not a detailed simulation but it, it nor is it just I don't know I threw some numbers at it right it, it it's what I would call this this sort of simulation by by abstraction Interesting. And then how's it going to scale for uh, different player counts like I'm very curious about how you're going to create this tension and that sort of follow along, should I? Feeling uh, if you're yeah. playing alone. So how is the game going to push where a person can't? Yeah, so it's it's there are really two different games. Uh, one is playable for two to five players, and in that case, you just you just drop off that other player. So so in a, in a one player game, Austria Hungary plays on their own. So perhaps I'll talk about that first. So if you if you just if it's just you, you're playing against a sort of high score bar that you're trying to achieve. And bearing in mind that you can you can sort of destroy yourself by pushing too hard to get that score because you've got cards in your deck that will make bad stuff happen, will make you mobilize on your own, even though you don't want to. You have one card that does that, but there are ways to get there. So in that case, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a high score test. It's like, can, can I, can I beat my last score? Can I, you know, the, the game is going to say, oh, if you get to 40 prestige, then that's an emphatic diplomatic victory. And maybe you've played it three times and you've only ever hit 28, 29. You're like, well, okay, let me keep going. Let me see if I can I can do better. In a, in a two-player game, we add Russia. 
uh, the, the, I guess if I, you know, given that I wanted to make it scalable for multiple players, that's just the way that I that I chose to approach it. But in that case, those are the two participants. We, we ignore Germany, we ignore France and Britain. We just say, well, you're watching, you're watching the other guy, and you're watching to see how they how they do, and uh, that generates enough tension. Just watching that one other player is enough to to, to kind of still make the game work. If you have a third player, well, we add Germany, and you add fourth, you add France, and a fifth, you add you add Britain. So the core narrative is still intact, even with with, with two, and arguably, you know, with with one, insofar as Austria Hungary is pushing and pushing and pushing. Nice. And then, um, is this a solo mode that you did yourself? Like, did you design for all player counts, or um, is this one of those things where you brought in a solo consultant? I I did it on my own, not because I have no truck for solo consultants. I just, I don't, I don't know any. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, when I'm designing anyway, my natural inclination is to, I sort of start trying to build a, a solo mode as part of it anyway, because I want to be testing it as I, as I go. So um, I don't know if, if someone had emailed me <laughs> and said, oh, I would love to, help you would I turn them away probably not no but um I don't know you know when you're in that kind of space you're just you're everything's happening fast and I and I sort of realized conceptually very early on that that's what it that's how it would do it just what I described that kind of scaling was going to be part of it I didn't it wasn't kind of top down where I had it and I was like okay well, uh, how do I how do I make this work for fewer people I, I just had always sort of designed it sort of bottom up if you like nice i'm really excited to try this and then i know from twitter that you have been doing a ton of research on this time period and you've been having all these like really interesting books come through um uh, what would you recommend for people to read if they want to do like a game and book thing uh where would you start yeah so um yeah and for full disclosure there's a lot of reading material and some of it is is huge and i Generally, um, some people tell me this is cheating, that I, I do a lot of index, index rating and I do a lot of skim reading and I sort of jump in and I read some paragraphs and I flick around the book and then I'm onto something else or I'm trying to connect it to, to, to another book. Perhaps I'm kind of chasing a particular um, personality. You know, there's, there's, there's 120 cards in this game, 20, 24 per per nation and most of those cards are on individuals so in some cases you know i'm trying to find I, i'm just kind of going to the index of one of 20 different books trying to find i don't know chersky right count chersky the um a, a german ambassador and i'm trying to find stuff to do with him to check that my evaluation of him is correct to check that i haven't missed some important sort of uh, sub narrative in, in there i would say that um th there's a really wonderful large series of books this is there's a they're huge these are albertini who was really the first person this, this is one there's three it's a three volume work um just a little light beach reading you know um he's really the foundational <laughs> work on on this subject he he was writing in world war ii it was published just after World War II. He's published in English just after World War II. And it, it's a pretty great read, but it, ta it takes a lot of time, right? If, if you're shorter of time, I would say uh, Thomas Ott's July Crisis is, yeah. is, is a really excellent book. It's, it's, it's pretty dense, but it's, it's, it's much shorter. It's a single volume work and uh, i thought that was excellent i th i think i don't have that on me right now uh, but this book also july 1914 by uh, sean mcmeekin is i i would recommend for it's it's a really good narrative flow right of, of just kind of just capturing keeping a lot of the different stories in balance bearing in mind you know once once the sarajevo assassination happens we've really got five different stories to track in in, in vienna berlin st petersburg paris and and london 
and and so that can be hard to 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 do but i, I think that mcmeekin does a really good job of job of that and uh, i've I, I found that that useful and, and other than that you know it's just a lot of different <laughs> i mean just a lot of different stuff so so just to keep it simple i'd say those three albertini is a bit more of a connoisseur's reach if you got access to a, a library of, I don't think it's I don't think it's in print right now but certainly those other two would be places that I would I would recommend you know a lot of people when I started on this project would say to me oh guns of August you know read Barbara Tuckman's guns of August and <laughs> it's it's a great book and 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 very well deservedly uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner and she writes tremendously well and but you know, to 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 be clear, she's not actually really writing about the July crisis. It has almost no. It's it's sort of barely mentioned, right? Her interest is later on in the crisis. It's it's really the, the last week or so. It's when the mobilization happens. She's interested in the the German cruisers that are on their way to Constantinople, as it was at the time that the British failed to intercept. That they get there it helps bring the Ottoman Empire into the war. She's much more interested in the early movements, particularly of the, the German armies through Belgium and northern northern France and the timing of all of this and the story of Mons, for example, the, the British sort of halting action that managed to hold up the, the, the German advance. So that's really where her focus lies. So if you if you go to Guns of August and you're excited about July crisis, it's not really that I mean barely, you know, Serbia is barely mentioned, right? Um, I guess I would say that uh, Sleepwalkers, Christopher Clark is also a good book. There's a lot of focus on, if you're interested in the Serbian perspective, there's a heavy weighting uh, there too. And that's also, yeah, that's also a really good, good book. Nice. So you talked about how you teach gaming and narrative. Uh, you also have an interest in historical gaming. How would you say that your current designs and your work inform each other? Because I feel like there is a lot of, like, you know, for example, you know, you talked about kind of wanting to move away from tactics into kind of like the feelings and, you know, political events of a war. I mean, I feel like that's kind of narrative, but like, how do you see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I do feel like that's the narrative. I, I, I think that in general, so, so what might be slightly different from some designers or if you like historian designers is that I think for, for them there might be a focus on how can I use this to teach history and I absolutely am interested in that but my students are generally less interested in, in the history my students are generally games designers they're, they're games designers and game scholars so in my case my, my focus is on deconstructing it is deconstructing that why have i made this like this why have i made these decisions and can you by analogy then imagine situations where you are faced with similar sorts of decisions where you're like I, you know it's 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 very pat it's very easy to say well you know is it gameplay versus accuracy and uh, that's a whole other huge debate but but trying to get people to think about that and trying to get them to, I'm, I'm really kind of opening the door into into my brain, and I'm saying, okay, so here's why I'm doing this, and here's why uh, I think it might work, but here's here are the issues with it, which come from different different directions. So that that's that's the the convergence. It's it's for is to show students sort of walk them through some of those processes and some of those those kind of you know, difficult, difficult decisions was having a conversation with the designer of Imperial Fever, a GMT game that's on P500 right now. And, you know, he, he it's a four player game and he's decided he's got a, a Germany and a Austria-Hungary combined. This is a 19th century sort of imperial setting. Germany and Austria-Hungary is a single player. He has France as a single player. Uh, I think Britain is a single player. And then Japan and the US is a single player and Russia is automated by some AI. So that alone, I don't know very much about the game yet, although I am interested in it and obviously backing it because I'm out of control. But um, 
you know, that's an interesting discussion. Like, why, how, how do you justify Japan and, and US together? The, the arguments to, to say that's a poor decision. There are the arguments to say, actually, you know, given the confines of, of the space he's working in, maybe that's a, maybe that's a kind of a smart choice. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my concept. So instead of, instead of like, how is this good, good history? My, my primary question for my students is, how is this good design given that it's trying to uh, approach history, but also trying to, trying to approach it seriously and, and with, consideration at the same time it's also got these other things it's trying to balance like playability and, and accessibility and so on oh that's a really interesting road to go down like the accuracy versus good game conflict i mean i don't necessarily think it's all one or all the other uh but i do think that um i don't know in in some ways maybe you're kind of touching on what makes historical fiction good too that it's not so much that everything that happens in the historical fiction has to be perfectly spot on but it does have to like capture something that has the essence of truth about it. Yeah, so people will talk about plausibility, right? So, so if it is it is it sufficiently plausible within the game system uh, that that it doesn't fall foul of our, of our notions of historical. Well, perhaps not accuracy, but perhaps authenticity, right? So some people talk about authenticity as a different way of conceiving of, of, of things. So, um, you know, accuracy is something that happens specifically on a specific time and, and place, then well, games can, <laughs> aren't going to do a very good job of that, given how they're, they're sort of movable systems, that, that things are happening on different times in different ways which gives us different outcomes which is really why we play the game because of the possibility of things spinning out differently uh, so you know authenticity is a way that people ap approach this which means different things to different people but perhaps it means um perhaps it's a subjective measure that it sort of feels right or perhaps it's it's to do with well it's it's theoretically plausible that these things might have happened so therefore it is yeah acceptable yeah i gotta um, tell you i really love the authenticity versus accuracy conversation uh mainly because i think that what we perceive as authenticity is so fluid and also often sometimes quite wrong um uh one thing i really enjoyed talking about on the last season of the podcast was you know kate cook who's a classicist who studies like women in ancient world video games had a lot of really interesting things to say about how even if you keep your history accurate um, even the presence of women or things that they do can be perceived as inauthentic. And that's also true, um, you know, and there's a, there's echoes of that in my interview with um, Stefan Aguirre Quiroga, who, who wrote White, White Mythic Space. Mm -hmm. So you can have it be accurate. There are people of color in your game about World War One, for example. Uh, but there's going to be a subset of people who refuse to perceive that as authentic. And I actually think that one of the things that is very powerful about games, and I think about writing too, fiction especially, um is that you you can move the needle on what feels authentic by putting out designs that show the world the way that you see it and helping people see through that lens yeah i no, i i entirely agree i don't remember the um do you say kate cook yes yeah i don't i remember but i don't remember it very well because it was a while ago but i do remember the uh conversation about white mythic space and that's absolutely right this, this idea of historical memory right which is which is another way of thinking about uh, authenticity that well it, it sort of it captures enough of what people think to be to be the case and this is why you know in a way history games are the sort of uh free license of a sort right because you don't have to pay for anything you know, no one owns it but it, it it's tying into people's into something that means something to people. It's already kind of pre-existing. So um, yeah, but if people have a wrong impression or something that you you, you challenge, you're, you're going a bit uphill. But then, you know, when someone like Stefan comes in and he writes his book and he starts coming on shows like yours and he starts talking about it, well, my optimism there is that he's helping shift it back another way and that, um, 
this this in some ways connects to the conversation I was having earlier about the political dimensions because we we've, we've sort of not done a good job, like I said, about representing them, bringing them to, to the fore, and you know that might be challenging people's concepts that well, why why should a a U.S. army in the throes of World War II? Why should it be concerned about Roosevelt being ill, right? Um, a different result, but, but well, they absolutely should because it becomes <laughs> because it becomes important, you know, because Truman's going to take over. Mark Herman's Churchill did, I think, was 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 probably a, an instrumental game for me playing that. I, I sort of thought, huh, yeah, this is really interesting. Why have I spent all my time thinking about these commanders on the in the field, whereas really the stuff that's really interesting is is you know that's a game where you're you're really building the post-war world by sort of cooperating. It's a cooperation game uh, together. You know, the, the the Russians, the British, and the the Americans. And that, to me, is a really smart way of, of approaching that that topic. It's not just that the game ends when you know Berlin or Tokyo are captured or, or surrender or what have you. So, um, yeah, I, I think in some ways they're sort of pushing. A, pushing the needle another way that pe people might not think of politicians as really having much contrib to contribute in a war. They're like, you know, just their job is to increase production and to say some nice words to keep the populace, you know, keep the morale up. And then when the war's done and the soldiers have done their work, then, then the civilians and the politicians can take over. And I think that that is a huge distortion and, uh, a, a real shame because I think are just it's just much more interesting when you just keep digging, and and uh, just <laughs> you know <laughs> just keep digging and you'll find all sorts of interesting stuff and it almost always is uh, sh shows you that we've we've been too neat and we're too um, we tied we tied ends up too neatly and that th things are messier and more complicated and there are far more people of all kinds involved in all kinds of ways with all kinds of complicated motivations so that's actually interesting too i mean you teach narrative and i feel like the human desire to make things very neat and to not have a cliffhanger and to have all the little plot points like close off nicely by the end of the book or by the end of the series is just so strong. Uh, but then history is so messy. So where do you feel like you exist on that spectrum between narrative neatness and historical chaos? I, I think that it's similar to what you probably heard other designers talking about, which is you, you've got to, choose an area of focus that you you can't do everything so if you try and do too much you try and spread things too thin you try and cover too many different sorts of topics then it's, it's, it's sort of very difficult for you to kind of put anything together that, that's coherent and, and playable but if you focus on the messiness right if, if, the, if the narrative messiness is the core of your topic so in the case of piece 1905 the core is well, you know, it's not just two two dudes from different countries get in a room and they sign they sign a treaty and go, okay, I guess that's the end of the war. You know, there's there's a conflict that they're battling each other to try and figure out. Well, how how can I get these terms in such a way that my boss, the czar or uh, the emperor in Tokyo, is is going to be okay with this? And I've got to get enough for my own state that I don't get. Uh, in all sorts of trouble when I go back home, right? So it's it's much it's much more complicated, and and so but that's the focus there. The focus is the messiness. It's this kind of push pull kind of I want this, but if I you know what maybe I should give you this issue, so that I can win this next issue, because you can also lose that game by again by just by winning too many issues that matter to your opponent. So you're trying to sort of second guess what what they want. And then similarly, if you talk about the beginning of a war. If, if your area of focus is the messiness, the way in which I'm trying to assert my nation's prestige, I don't want to lose in this political crisis, I don't, this diplomatic crisis. I don't want to look weak. So I'm therefore going to push our case to do what we want, which makes me a good diplomat, right? Um, 
but I, I got to not overcook that. So in each of those cases, that's, that's the emphasis. And so everything else has to fit around that. That's why, you know, it's, it's playable in two hours in the case of crisis, probably a bit longer when you're first learning with five players, but, uh, and it's not playable in real time for six weeks with about, you know, 700 people because it's just not, it's not practical. So you're, you're choosing. So in, in the same way, I think it's, it's not really any different from a narrative or a, a design perspective, really. It's, it's choose an area of focus, hit that and make everything operate within and, and feeding into that and around that. That's, that's the core that you're, that you're going for. And in essence, you could, you could say it's sort of, they're both narratively driven in a sense in that, I'm concerned about the feeling. What I most want players is to have is a feeling. Um, and then from that feeling, it's it's what I, I, I guess I would sort of call a sort of, um, it's, it's an experiential quality, right? That, that that's, that's what I think, that's one of the powerful things that games can do is put people in this place where they're feeling something that is akin to to, to, the, to the reality and trying to put them in that place so that that's exciting for them and then, it spirals off into all sorts of reading and, and deeper understanding. And, uh, but without that, without that feeling as the essence of it, it's, I don't, I, I don't know what I would hinge on, you know, I don't know what I would, what my focus would be. So you get both narrative coherence and design coherence by, by your selectivity and, and, a, and a sort of focus and an awareness that you can't do everything. It's a disaster to try and do too many too many things, and that's why I, I I tend to use this way of thinking about it, sort of uh, simulation by abstraction, right? Because so it's not it's 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 just not detailed and accurate, but nor is it nothing. And and the, that abstraction is a way to get at something that I am in, interested in simulating. I'm simu trying to simulate a sort of feeling and experience of sorts. So you talk about focus in terms of topic. Uh, I think there's also always, even though we want to say our games are for everyone and everyone should play, uh, there's also obviously a focus in terms of audience and who you feel you're kind of in dialogue with. So uh, who is that for you with Crisis 1914? Well, uh, my hope is that the War Games audience will approach it somewhat, perhaps with a, a little bit of uh, caution. It's, it's published by Worthington, who substantially publish war games um but my my hope is that people will understand i don't really want to get into this whole conversation right now about what is a war game that might be don't worry i won't everyone. make you i've had plenty of those already <laughs> <laughs> my, my hope is that it's 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 skewing enough into a broader area that is widens the audience and uh, just will appeal to more people, you know? So in fact, Worthington also sort of now starting to publish some other sorts of games that are sort of war games adjacent, I suppose, insofar as they have some mechanics that are like that, they have something on the uh, on dinosaurs right now, right? But um, I very much, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, a, in a broader audience. Th this is, Neither of those these particular games we're talking about uh, a lot recently, Crisis and Peace Nineteen Hundred Five. Neither of them are complicated games in terms of you know they're not dense rules. They're, they're essentially play play a card, right? Is is pretty much what happens on a turn. But figuring out which card to play, why and when, uh, is is the issue. So yeah, my my feeling is that it's it's kind of a, a an overlap audience. That it will be some people who are super into war games and some people who are, are sort of more casual gamers or more <laughs> I, I think gamers who are interested in history but don't necessarily think that military history is is for them I, I was posting something on social media the other day and and i saw someone's comment saying oh i don't want to prevent world war one I. I don't want it not to happen i just want to win it and i guess you know that's fine right and in fact turns out they're in luck because there's an awful lot of games that let them do that. There's an awful lot of games that let you play World War One, And I have nothing against those games. Many of them are great. I've played lots of them and I've enjoyed them a lot. I just want to come in and give something uh, different. And I, if, I, if I have an audience, I think it will be that, that overlap 
space. I think there'll be people who play Paths of Glory. You think, hmm, this is interesting. Maybe I'm, I've, I've read around the topic and I'm interested in the style of the war. Let me let me see if this is for me. But I think that people who play, I don't know, Seven Wonders or more sort of Euro skewing things. I'm, I, my hope is that they somehow get to hear of it I, and 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 sort of think. Uh, I don't know. I mean that it's it's a little bit more of a, a social interaction game, at least when you play with the two two players and upwards. So, you know, in some ways, ask me again in a whenever the game's out, and we'll we'll find out if it if it found an audience and, and who it was. I would certainly be disappointed if it was only the war games crowd, because I just my hope was that I could reach a, a wider audience with it. Got it. So we got uh, Russ here saying, do it. We always love that. I'm assuming this is in reference to uh, discussing what is a war game. <laughs> we got a little incendiary action here in the comments. <laughs> uh, but he also says, uh, Worthington does a great job with production from what I've seen as well. I think is a great spot for Crisis 1914. That is true. Worthington has had some very nice productions. Um, I've got some reviews of Worthington games coming up. Um, and I will say it's a nice, it's nice printings. Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy with the uh, what they what they've been doing. I mean, my my involvement with them only began sort of 2019 when uh, Freeman's Farm came out, uh, and and pretty much ever since then, everything they've been doing, at least you know for for me and and in that area that I've I've been connected with, and and sort of yeah, 2019 onwards has been pretty amazing. Like the the the, the the quality of components and, and so on and the, and the art has been absolutely fantastic. And if people who are sort of board gamers, but not war gamers hear that, oh, it's a small publisher, it's a war game publisher. Uh, it's absolutely not what they expect when they open a box and they see what you know what's inside. So yeah, I think they're doing an, an amazing job there. Excellent. And then, so uh, we, we don't have to end this conversation now, but uh, I do want to make sure we, I don't forget to ask you this. Mm -hmm. So you, this is going to go on Kickstarter soon. Uh, yeah. When? and uh yeah what's the what's the timeline so i don't i don't know exactly uh, i know that uh it's it's sort of it's going to be july uh, just waiting for some confirmation so i think that my understanding is the timeline is f i'll probably find out in the next week or so kind of when, when the actual date is going to be I, I it's certainly before the end of july i'm expecting it to to go live there's already a page on kickstarter that people can sign up to and sort of ask you to, you know, um, register so it gives you more information when when it's available. And I, yeah, so I don't know. May, maybe early early next year, I think, would be the plan for that to 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 finally launch. I think that the thinking is that they. My recent understanding is that they they plan to do a, a stretch goal for these historical and design notes that I'm working on. I the they run to several thousand words right now. It's probably it's about sixty pages. It's, it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of notes that I'm trying to get into the game that I want to publish with the game, and they want to do that because uh, lots of players really like that stuff, being able to see the history behind the cards. And like I said, there's a lot of cards, there's a lot of history, um, but there aren't really any other components, by the way. It's really just cards and a few trackers, I suppose. Um, so yeah, the the plan is to to launch that historical design notes, I think is a stretch goal is my, my recent understanding. Fantastic. I personally am looking forward to it a lot. So um, for fun, uh, what are you playing right now that you're enjoying? Okay, so not including prototypes, and I'm going to not include card games that I'm playing with my six year old. I, I'm still playing a lot of War of the Ring. So um, the Ares game about Lord of the Rings, I am playing that with Chris. You know Chris. Uh, playing that with, <laughs> with him every so often. I actually have the uh, fancy anniversary edition with the, all the painted miniatures, and we have the large mat, and we sort of play in that about once a week when we, when we can. So that. Uh, I've also played some War of Whispers. 
Did you ever play that? No, I keep seeing the box cover. Like, I feel like everybody has it except me. Somebody brought it to a game night I was at the other night. We just didn't play it. We played Pax Renaissance instead, which I did not regret at all. But <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but I, so, I do want to play that. War Whispers, great. R really, it, it's sort of like um, if someone came to you as a designer and said, I want a uh, Game of Thrones game, but we haven't got the license. What can you do? That's a great response right there. You know, it's essentially you're the power behind the, the throne. You don't you don't control any empires, but you influence them. You're kind of worm tongue, you know, just just a mix in fantasy worlds, but sort of whispering in their ear and sort of making stuff happen. And and really you're kind of just betting on who you want to win. And occasionally you can you can change your, your bets. But really interesting game and fast pretty accessible you can play it with people who are not really hardcore gamers um so that i did play some uh land of freedom alex knight's game really great game i really like that a lot um particularly if you can get three players together yes. super interesting cooperation game again again kind of feeds into some of what we were talking about earlier smart design uh condensed this complicated history down in a manageable way. Very, very strong. I'm really looking forward to seeing what else Alex does. I think he's, he's to me, he's a new voice. I hadn't heard of him until Land of Freedom, perhaps. It is his so, first game. Yeah, so I, I don't know whether, you know, lots of people who, when they bring out their first game, it's almost certainly not the first game that they've made, right? There's other things that they've been working on that kind of got them there. And anyway, I'm super interested to see what he's, what else he's up to. I did play some Votes for Women, Tory Brown's game, Fort Circle game. Really like that too. Just again, you know, Fort Circle, really good production values. So I'm excited about what they'll do with Peace. And of course, you have your Night Witches signed with them as well. In fact, I think you your announcement came a few weeks just before us. It will be uh, stable buddies, I guess. Yes. Yeah. You know, Circle DC, like a lot of business got done at Circle DC. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, and I, I took Crisis there as well and played that with um, some, all, all sorts of people, but Dan Bullock in, in particular was was there, really good to, to hear his thoughts and just to see him playing it. And um, yeah, he's also a super fascinating designer. The, the stuff that he's interested in, the topics that he's choosing. It's, yeah. You know, super exciting time. Yeah, I'm actually very concerned about like, his boutique project that's coming up that's only got 100 copies like it's on my calendar oh uh, that's the the gods will have blood yes yeah uh the current date is july 13th uh mm -hmm. it is on I, I literally have an alarm set i'm going to get my butt over to game found and street fight to make sure that i get a copy <laughs> of that game <laughs> So everybody just log on later. Let me let me get mm -hmm. my copy. <laughs> yeah, and his blood and treasure sounds super cool too. Yeah, I'm really, really excited about what he's up to. Yeah. But yeah, all those deals that we did while we were in the Masonic Lodge room and, and took a trip to the Pentagon, none of this was mysterious at all. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't wait. I'm, you know, now it to me it's that's one of the primary conventions to go to for us i know us i just can't believe the last one was the first one now it's like a must go it's already yeah. like on the list of things that i will beg for time off for at work yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah <laughs> good times i'm very excited about all of the projects you have going yeah i'm actually so because so night witches actually is my first game so i'm just kind of like taking the non-traditional route i think um <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, it helps to have a friend that you're intentionally going to do a project with, but I've got other little things starting to cook. And so I guess mm -hmm. eventually I'll have like a pipeline just like everybody else. So yeah. It's well, gonna happen. or will the pipeline have you? Ugh, I don't know. Sorry. There are things that are definitely the course of events can catch you sometimes mm -hmm. just as in the crisis of 1914. <laughs> well, it ends up having this momentum of its, of its own. So, so that might sound a sort of flippant comment, but I generally mean that like there's a way in which these, these, your own pipeline ends up really kind of, you know, it doesn't, it controls you more than you control it, right? Like there's just this ongoing momentum of you just kind of building stuff. And, you know, bearing in mind lots of, in, in this space, it's not like you've got a, 
a publisher who's often cracking the whip behind you. And if they are, it's probably, you know, it's, it's not very violently applied, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's more just that there's just so many interesting things to do. I, ju I just sort of, you know, just can't, it can barely keep up with all the different things that, that seem exciting to touch. And then, I don't know, yeah, a publisher says, oh, hey, just wondered if you might be interested in doing a game on this. And already you're saying yes, before you've even really stopped to think about how could that possibly fit given how time works? Uh, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. It'll happen. <laughs> um, we have a commenter, Arno Vandevelde. Uh, sorry if I pronounced your name mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, interesting talk with stuff like Prime Minister and Congress of Vienna being some of the more interesting things in the pipeline. It's right up my alley. Great yeah. to see more focus on the political. Yeah, I these things agree. look super interesting, don't they? And, you know, Congress of Vienna, of course, sort of is connected to the, the Churchill system. I'm super intrigued to see what they did there, how they addressed it. Prime Minister, yeah, really want to super interested to, to to tackle that. I see Mr. President has just, that's been shipping, isn't it, today? Mr. President? Yeah, I got a yeah. copy of it last week, and I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. I just finished up a tutorial that's been, like, really eating my time, and now I can go back to doing what I want to do, Okay. and that includes Mr. President. I'm going to just call it Dr. President. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, Arno, I know. I, I agree. This, this, this space is really just ex exploding now, and it's, it's, I think, partly informed by the sorts of mechanics that we're pulling from from Euro games that are giving us the, the, the propensity to, the, the, the potential to do this, that they're kind of giving us, um, pushing us in, in, in more uh, complex and nuanced directions that are not just, I, I defeat you when you, I take your capital's city, you know. Yeah. No, I really, I do believe that we are in a good age for historical gaming. And I'm glad that you're here to contribute to that. I, you know, I, it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to, to feel, I, I genuinely feel part of this community of people who are making, uh, making these games, talking about them, thinking about them in interesting, um, interesting ways. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's what a time to be alive. Indeed. I think it's a good moment to conclude. But Maurice, thank you so much for coming on. I'm super excited about your game. I can't wait to try it. Um, I will certainly be trying Rebellion Britannia soon, but I feel very special that I get to try it early. So we, uh, we may be getting together to talk some more about that soon. <laughs> Let's do that. All right. Thanks, Liz. <laughs> thank you so much. Everybody who's out there, please like, subscribe, ask, com ask questions, You know, leave us some comments, and most of all, happy gaming.